and that has to be taken into account when you are trying to introduce a new product or if you are in the sales team, obviously this is going to impact you a lot, which is six months, one year, uh, things like that, right? And from my point of view as well, the one of the things that in an enterprise is, it, it impacts is like quite defining that the roles are very defined. Uh, something that you will find in a smaller company where someone has different hats, um, the, where the product owner of the well as the platform owner, or for example, you have a technical product here an FTA. In an enterprise company or in an enterprise project, given the size and given the complexity of the that you need to have those roles more defined because you will find uh, conflicts with yourself. You try to make a decision, for example, in the draft, not in the, the, the product. Like that kind of um, uh, conversations you will be having, obviously, having the conversation with yourself. Um, next. Um, to define exactly what an enterprise will be, or the most accurate way, uh, to me I will say mainly that this uh, project where we are having where we have a big team, uh, things like 10 people, 20 people, more than that, it's quite common, just developers, and then on top of that, you have to put um, project uh, owners, yeah, the, the people uh, around that, uh, to make sure that we are behaving. And the size of the project, we are also uh, going to talk about six months, one year, two years, sometimes longer. Uh, sometimes even we are talking about five years period because when you are talking with this kind of uh, companies, they want to sign, they want to sign long term. Um, something like five years is totally, uh, totally normal. Right? And we are going to have third parties, a lot of third parties, and with third parties I mean agencies. Sometimes it's an agency building the design, sometimes it's a, a, could be a, it could be a partner doing some development. Um, it could be some external project which is going to hook into, into your um, your project. It could be internal departments, like Salesforce, things like that, that you have to, to hook into that. And all of this brings a lot of complexity, right? Complexity is in, in development, of course, but a lot of complexity is in communication as well. Um, on top of those complexities, you have to think that we are talking about companies that are really well known. So there is a lot of pressure in terms of if you make a mistake, it's, it could end up in the press, right? So it has to be, everything has to be very well thought and uh, you have to have everything, try to, try to have uh, mitigation in place, let's say. Uh, next, Terry. Thank you very much. And at the end, some of the things are um, common for uh, enterprise, but you will see that some of them are common also in, in small companies, right? Reduction of costs. Uh, that's not for companies, even it's even for, for individuals. But someone to, if you reduce costs, you're going to increase your, your revenue, and uh, you have more money for whatever you want the company or in the research, etc. We are talking about big platforms. Uh, Dozen of sites, but very easily could go into a thousand sites. Right? Um, on that complexity, it needs to be a centralized way of managing that. And that's a common mistake that we see a lot of times, or you jump in a project which has been running for a few years, and then you want to migrate from a different CMS, and they are moving to Drupal or whatever, and uh, you can see that they've been running a, a massive company in different countries, and its department has been having their own peak, their own thing going on, and suddenly after two or three years, they realize that this is scaf, right? You need to put some order in there, and you, put, you need to put some centralized um, management in there to make sure that, for example, what I was talking before about the risk, right? If something happens, it will impact the image of the company, so you need to be careful internally as well on how, how you are going to manage the different actors, different stakeholders, etc. Um, and there is a quite well this is not always the case but sometimes you have to fly and you have to try to steer the customer in the right direction because harmonization is not always one of the first first things that people think when they are starting up a project like this and if you think about that you wouldn't expect apple to have a different maybe if you open apple uh, in uk than if you open apple in, in spain right? however a lot of other companies 
but it's, uh, it's not the first thought, so we're saying so. Uh, and that, again, brings more complexities when you have to um, fight between different actors and maybe bringing complexities or things that are fighting each other in a platform, right? And we will go on to that today as well in a few slides. Thank you, Tony. Cool. So, yeah, as I said, there's big teams with lots of complexity, uh, and the best way to deal with that is to kind of plan and define what you're doing. So the first thing you do is you need to actually work out what you're building and why. So, this is me with my product guy hat on, but it's relevant to all people involved because if you haven't got a clearly defined product that you're um, you're all building, that everybody's working towards then you can't really all drive down the same road. You're going to end up doing different things, doing chaotic stuff. Um, you won't know what needs defining. You won't know what needs um, understanding, breaking down, and uh, grooming for, uh, for development. So, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Terry. I think we are not recording the room. The meeting. We'll be good to. I don't think I have permissions. Karen, could you, someone in the room, could you start doing recording? <laughs> oh, what damn. Everyone left the room. <laughs> no, we're still here. We're right here. Woo Where is. There's a little button on the bottom. There it no, is. No, it's a button on the bottom that says record. You mean that one? Yes, according to the cloud. <laughs> okay, so let's start again. Yes, start again, please. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, right, so, um, yeah. So, uh, kicking back in then from uh, where we were. So, we're talking about the uh, pro defining the product and knowing what it is you're building and why. Because um, you need to know what you're building to be able to all move in the same direction uh, and um, end up with a positive product that solves a genuine problem. Um, it's also interesting to know why that organisation should solve it as well. Um, that's, a, that's kind of a, a key and critical question which a lot of people don't ask themselves. So anybody that plays the, uh, the business strategy game will know this is a, a, a drastically simplified diagram. And it kind of gives an idea of what I'm trying to talk about. So at the top, there's a business. That business has a vision. You know, if you are someone like IKEA, for example, to give a really well-known example, their vision might be to create a better everyday life for many people. It's like a super top level thing, and that could mean many different things. But obviously, what then happens is uh, strategies are derived from that vision to uh, then start talking about individual ways that that vision could be realized. So, you know, they could be talking about uh, the fact that they have meatballs, which means that uh, parents can serve easy meals to their kids every Monday uh, without too much stress. You know, that's a, that's a massive improvement to my wife's everyday life, I can tell you that much. Um, or the furniture loan. So those are the individual strategies. And then underneath those strategies, you're then thinking about products that you can create that help realize those, realize those strategies, help uh, kind of implement them and solve problems to actually push that strategy forward. So uh, as you're building out a product down here, you should be able to track back up to the top, to the company's vision, uh, and see why what you're building has a genuine impact. So there should always be traceability all the way up. If you find that you're working on something um, and it's not clear why you're building that thing, what that thing does for the organization you're building, um, I would implore you to ask why. Now, hopefully, somebody will be able to um, tell you why. Um, but a lot of the time, you might find out, because it's such a big uh, organization or an enterprise, um, you might find that it's actually somebody over here and said, oh, I've got an idea, and they kind of run away and they might spoil some money, uh, and, and they haven't thought it through, and actually they're building something which is their little pet project, maybe, um, which sounds ridiculous, you might be building a very large pet project, but it might not tie with business goals, and then you'd be amazed how quickly you can suddenly find um, somebody will cut on to that, maybe in the finance department, will ask the questions of, why is this thing been built? And if it can't be validated against those visions, it can't actually work. Yeah, you know what I'm, I'm talking about. It. Then you might suddenly find actually the whole thing vanishes from underneath you. So uh, we've actually seen that happen. Um, so I would employ you just just be aware and always always 
track it up and, and make sure what you're doing is really of value to that business. So you know, it, 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 like someone got the case of the of the Abbey and then they were playing with a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not clear on the direction that we're going, they just got a new toy and they were just playing with that, right? And then as you were saying, they get in trouble because finance is asking questions. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And then if you were to kind of like scan down through, so if you uh, build all this out and you've got down to the product points, what you're hoping is that uh, for, for all the technical people in the room, you're hoping that somebody has said, I've got product X, that product is going to solve problem Y, and then um, that problem has been broken down into features, like the definitions of the parts of the problem that are to be solved, and it's been built out so that you've got a clear um, roadmap for maybe 18 to 36 months of features, of things, of kind of defined segments of the problem um, that all go together to build out that product. That all relate back up to all the way up to strategies, the business, um, the business uh, vision. So you can really trace and see exactly what's going on, and then uh, you would always expect to see a decent amount of visibility in this. Uh, for a period of months. You don't have to have, like, you know, uh, this is the, anybody who's done the agile and stuff, you'll kind of recognize the concept of very granular things. So, down here, when you're about to build something, it needs to become an eight point story that one developer can pick up and work on in the sprint. But in 36 months' time, you might be um, talking about something that's just like three words and a theory of, I want to personalize my product, you know. But at least you know you're moving in that direction. Um, and that visibility. That plan helps you think about what you're building down here. So you might be building out a very small feature down here. But if you've got visibility that in the future you're going to be working on things that do roughly this kind of idea, it might drastically change the solution you go for, or it might help inform decisions if um, there, there's maybe two routes to take. Uh, like if you know down here that uh, translation and uh, multilingual is a really big thing. You might use one solution versus uh, versus a completely different one if you know it's always going to be in one language. That kind of thing. Um, so and then, once you've got that and you kind of worked your way through, just be aware the uh, for whoever's defining it, you need to keep redefining as you learn. Um, and for whoever's building it, expect that that roadmap will change. It should be organic. It should evolve. It should be um, a live document, but it, um, but it should be there as well. Just that it's going to manipulate because you do learn things, you do change your mind, you do see different things as you move forwards. Everyone and anyone in the process can and should be able to ask why. If you can't, if you're not sure why, you can't make the right decisions, and anybody should be able to trace it back up to the top and should give you a decent answer. If they can't, then start waving red flags, please. Uh, you can use methodologies. If you're not, if you're not um, confident enough to challenge uh, senior. Uh, management, maybe, or the product owner, if you're kind of uh, not that way inclined, you want to um, some assistance in asking why. You can use methodologies or, or a system to help you out that. There's a, a, a book by a chap called Marty Keegan called Inspired, and in that he lists out. Uh, this has been covered in many places. But it's quite a good little list, quite a simple list in that book. Uh, Ten questions you can ask, um, which would help you. Uh, decide if you want to build a product. Um, things like uh, exactly who does the problem solve it for, how big is the opportunity, like the market size, how would you measure the success, the KPIs of the product. That's an amazing one. Uh, a lot of people don't have key performance indicators associated with the product. You can never feel like you've achieved it or won because there's no, um, there's no metric you can apply to it to, to demonstrate the success. So all these kind of questions, there's, there's a lot of things around it. If in doubt, use those to help you um, ask the question, because you should always do so. Okay, once you've got all that defined and the product is there, then you need to start the uh, project discovery. That's our terminology. I know there's there's many different ways of terming it. Each company's got their own thing. That's the accurate term. I'm not used to it now. Um, but essentially, it's the translation process. Because you need to go from business requirements down into um, or business problems to solve even is, is the ideal solution, down into um, actual um, technical specification that the developers, the boots on the ground, can sort out and start building forwards. So in that process, there's, uh, you've got to deep dive into everything. You've got to really drill down. And there'll be a certain period where I showed you that they, you know, the more granular features are lined up. You're only going to work a certain point of the roadmap. But on the bits you're working in, 
drill down right into it and get to know as much as you possibly can. There's always going to be things you don't spot, but just never be afraid to ask a stupid question in those situations because um, a lot of the time you might be sitting there thinking, oh, everybody else knows what, I don't know, that particular acronym means or why somebody's talking about a C mammal. And you just, other people might have, most other people in the room might also have no idea, but they're also just thinking that it's a silly question. So if you ask a stupid question, um, you'd be amazed how um, valuable that can be in those sessions. But yeah, just keep drilling down, drilling down, drilling down until you get the information you need. Um, I actually want to go on a couple of next points. Yeah, so uh, the project discovery to me is one of the most, not the most, but one of the most interesting parts in the project because it's like a honeymoon, right? We are, you are starting to discover, um, to, sorry, my dog is just not enough, I hope it's not any. Um, so you are starting to know both the project and the, um, and the customer. And um, this is where you get to, to build your new toy, right? Um, one of the biggest problems that I've seen on most of the projects is that the customer normally knows what he wants, right? Or he thinks he knows what he wants. Um, the conversation is really easy uh, that it, it's going to go in the wrong direction. They are going to show you how they want to build this, this thing that they have in mind. And this is really wrong because you are not here because you just build things. You are there because you have the technical knowledge to find the business value, right? To find what they want to do. And then once you have all the, all the answers, all the questions, uh, how to build it is a, is a technical decision, right? Um, I have a lot of examples uh, that could have compromised a project, like uh, you go into, uh, into a room and they ask you, look, I want a microsites. I don't know why everyone wants to be microsites. And they ask you, I, I want a, a users to be able to register when they are in this microsite. Okay, we have to link notes, content pages, right? You have to link that to users. If you try to do it in the way the customer is asking you, then you are going to get really silly in the trouble, right? Because Drupal is flexible, but you should be careful in how to do things like uh, user and not go against what Drupal has, knows how to do uh, well, right? If you start to steal a conversation on, okay, what do you really want to do? And they start to tell you, okay, one, people to be able to go to this place, this microsite, but not able to see unless you start to see patterns because you have the knowledge, right? And if you know a little bit of Drupal, and you know that you have organic, for example, there are probably casting and things like that, but it's probably much better than having to be in the whole solution from scratch, and then you come, if the project is going to have millions of users per day, uh, other products I'm sure can be uh, built around that, right? Um, Mm, yeah, and, uh, in this space, like, you have to be uh, very strong in terms of be confident on your technical skills and make sure that sometimes it's difficult, sometimes you won't be able to do that because uh, sometimes customers just want something and you will have to. But this is really where that if you are the expert in the room, the expert in the room, and you are recommending something, it's very where that you will go against that, right? Because that could, could compromise the whole project. Um, text, sorry. Um, I love this phrase, uh, and this represents a lot, right? If you are asking, uh, if you want, if you just do what your customer is asking, uh, for example, in the case of Harry, Harry Ford, uh, people just wanted faster horse. Because there was no cars at the moment, right? So you have the technical knowledge, uh, you have to be responsible, you have to change and steal the conversation, right? right uh, next two. I'm going to go in my part, which is the development, which will be the, the next phase, and a little bit more days on on how we sort this from the Drupal uh, point of view, right? Without going into much data, I that we cannot go on this talk on details and technical stuff. Um, next, third. Uh, do you know about Drupal multi sites? And you may have heard that Drupal multi sites died. <laughs> or if you look at the internet, uh, you will see some links that, especially one post in, in Drupal that has like eight years or something like that, was saying that Drupal multi-site in Drupal was going to die. Well, Drupal multi-site is not the panacea, it's not the uh, silver bullet, but it solves very well 
uh, some given problems, right? And you have to know what you are using. At the end, it's like uh, it's about knowing the tools that you are going to use and knowing when you have to use them. If you remember when you were when I was starting to talk about what is an enterprise and what kind of things or what kind of products we have uh, an enterprise, we are talking about harmonized, um, harmonized product, harmonized platforms. We are talking about centralized management. We are talking about one team managing all of that to save costs, etc., etc. That is exactly what we decided to do, right? You have a single code base, and you can spin up thousands of sites if you want. That's that's a problem solution. We we, we I have seen um, sites uh, platforms with thousands of sites running on, on this uh, on this uh, architecture. And it's a scalable, right? And it's maintained by the by the community. So uh, definitely, what is is not dead. Now, uh, next slide. Um, some problems, because as I was saying, uh, what is is not the the silver bullet. Uh, you need to know when it's good and when it's not, and you will find problems that is not necessarily a multi side problem, but. For example, the configuration management. Configuration management is an amazing thing, I enjoy by it. And if you have two or three websites, uh, it's silly good because you can pack everything in your database, put it in code, um, bam, right? Easy. Now, what happens when you have 100 sites? Or when you have 1,000 sites? Um, and what happens when on those sites, some people want to make changes? That starts to be a bit of uh, a nightmare to not then. And for what I've seen so far, configuration management is not well designed for this. There are workarounds around that. But for example, the old way of doing it in terms of packaging uh, features and modules and then delivering that and making changes with updates, that worked really well in Drupal 7. And this is, for example, a model that can work really well as well with uh, thousands of sites, I don't know of sites. Um, yeah, so um, you have to be careful when you start to see that they are trying to push the limits of uh, what that platform should be doing. Because as I was saying, some people will want, or some stakeholders will want the control on personalizing a lot of things on their website, although it's a part of your platform. But when you start to see that this is getting out of hand, then you have to stop and think if. Uh, that product needs to be split, right? For example, um, well, at the moment where everyone is trying to personalize the uh, their own type on the website, is trying to change the color, to, so that looks like a lot of work and needs to be uh, synchronized between different websites, and it looks like uh, yeah, it could compromise. For example, if we are talking about uh, mixing e-commerce uh, projects with a portfolio website, it's a very different uh, project, right? So when you see features coming to the platform like that, then you have to question the customer. Are you sure you want to go through this, which is going to uh, cost more to maintain in terms of effort and um, putting things on the platform that could work well each other, etc., etc., et right? And that's where I go on the next slide, sorry, uh, where you have to think about about having that conversation, right? Go to the next slide, which is about um, breaking the product. Um, Drupal is good, as I was saying, for harmonized platforms. Again, portfolio sites, uh, for example, or commerce, or you, you can build products, a big platform around something which is well harmonized, right? Um, but if you start to mix things like uh, like that, like having an account with very different DNA, DNA to a uh, portfolio site, you will find that you are going to have a lot of clashing between um, between the features that you are trying to build with the ones that the platform already has, etc. Et that means that multi site is not the right solution. Um, not necessarily because there's things that you can do around that and it's still clean. You probably know about uh, lightning distribution or global distribution as uh, lightning. I'm using lightning because I use that example for breaking to a few months back, where uh, they wanted to build a product which is quite different to the product that we were working on, right? So the next iteration looked like this is growing too much. Um, and the company itself, they were splitting the code. 
the core, right? Into into that, into two completely different different products or code bases. If you think about that, we are coming back to the previous scenario where you land on this uh, approach where you have maybe a dozen of countries and each one of the countries have different products that goes probably in the wrong direction because it can't get back into that heavy uh, maintainable, unmaintainable source, right? Um, I was mentioning lightning because lightning is, is an amazing way of simplifying that. Um, I'm sure, for example, that an e-commerce on, on a portfolio site are going to be very different, but you can find which is common both. And you could build a distribution for the company that could solve the problem of having that code base and then give the other bits that the other part of the department want to, want to maintain. And this makes a lot of sense for, uh, for several reasons, but if you are in an enterprise project or a company, you are going to need things like certifying the product. Like if you have a hundred or a dozen uh, different projects, you will have to certify each one of them, and this is an expensive and very uh, exhaustive uh, process that can last uh, weeks, months, etc. Right? If you go to the approach of having a line, uh, sorry, not a line, um, Drupal distribution, what it means is that you have a core. That core can be um, certified, and then you benefit of the other product, products not having to certify at least the whole product, right? Because the core is already done. And you have a, another big advantage that the biggest part in what the other products are going to use is probably, the, obviously, the core itself, but you will also have shared things like single sign on uh, things, things that will live in the core. Uh, country modules, for example, that are going to be uh, common on all of the sites. And having that in, a, in this approach of using a, a company distribution, let's call it corporation distribution, uh, it brings a lot of benefit, not just from that certification I was talking, but also when SIP hits the fan, right? I'm sorry for the expression, but when you have at night in the night that the security team is saying uh, we have a huge problem with the security uh, release that probably is releasing, that's amazing, the security team is amazing, and, uh, we are covered with big confidence, but suddenly when you have a lot of products, uh, and maybe have two or three teams, that's a problem to bring everyone at 10 in the night and how to take uh, all of that, right? If you have a more centralized approach, uh, you do the work in one, and then the idea is that you are going to uh, provide those changes to the, to the distributions, just the way like in the other uh, distribution works, right? Yep, okay. Cool. So um, Alex was just talking very much about um, managing from the technical point of view, like many, many sites. And th these numbers he's talking about are not unusual, uh, like the thousands of sites. Um, but even if you're in the tens, tens or hundreds, um, still there's there's a few things from the platform management point of view. So this is the more the um, the, the business or the user side of management, I guess maybe um, the utilization of your products. There's there's still a lot of considerations on that side as well that's also worth uh, thinking about as you're building out the products. So um, for those updates. Uh, for the visibility of who you're using it, for the management of it, you need to think of ways that you're building out your products that you can take a one-to-many approach. By that I mean, so, um, j just as the security team might say, hey, we need to uh, release this security update to a thousand sites in the next 10 minutes, or we'll be fined three billion pounds, or something like that, which is kind of crazy thing to have. Uh, you might suddenly find that uh, the same thousand sites need to all update their, um, their cookie compliance message or something like that because, um, because uh, an entire country's uh, changed their legislation, that kind of thing, or um, uh, many other situations. So you, you need to be thinking about ways that you can um, handle that in a, um, a simple and um, you know, kind of fundamentally manageable way. So if you've got to jump in and you've got to make a text update to two or three sites, then you can have a very different approach. So if you've got two or three sites in the portfolio, uh, they can be individual sites, you jump in, you can make that text update, copy and paste, it's fine. If you've got to do that for a thousand sites, you might have, you might need to employ an entire team of people that are going to solve that with people. 
all have people running on that for, for weeks at a time. It's just, there's so much room for human error. There's so much room for confusion. So the sites might get missed off. Wrong text might be copied the other side again. It's just not a viable solution. So you need to work out ways as you're thinking about fundamental elements of the sites that would be shared or um, how you're going to um, manage that in a, in a viable and one-to-many way. That also goes for things like generating visibility of what the sites are doing. So um, it might be that uh, like one of the key KPIs for your sites uh, or your platform is for each customer their, their kind of user base or how frequently they're being used. Um, so you don't want to have to log into each site or each site's analytics maybe to, to see that, or maybe to glean that data from a central place. Um, or it might be uh, you've got some particular risks associated. So in enterprises, again, security can be a massive thing and it might be that you need to really ensure that only certain people or certain numbers of people or some kind of criteria around, say, user roles are available. You might um, need to limit the admin user roles to one or two people with particular security clearance for that side, uh, that side of that platform. So you need a, a way of um, being able to access that data, um, have early warnings for if something's obviously going wrong, which you can, you can programmatically check these things, or even just a, a dashboard. Dashboards really are your friend um, when you're playing the platform, so you can, at a glance, just have an intelligently put together dashboard with key bits of information um, can really just help you see, show, alert you to uh, things that are good or things that are bad uh, so fast, whereas otherwise you might never know, you might never know if the customer's failing and they're about to uh, leave your site because they're down to three, three users a week. You just wouldn't know these things unless you've got the tools in place. So I'm a big fan of thinking about that because it takes efforts to build that in across different sites. You know, you might need to develop particular APIs or um, specific uh, mechanisms for doing it, but it's the, the effort up front is well worth it and it's something that you could be advocating very strongly to your product owners as you're building these things out because they won't necessarily think about it until they're stuck they don't have that data and they're screaming at you because they don't know what's going on if you think about that Marie, um this like works quite well with the contributed approach of the, of the community right where you're developing uh, one to many uh, when you're building a contributed module you're not building it for yourself you're building it for for a massive usage pay for as much as possible, right? So you're not thinking on a, on a single solution, you're more thinking of about how can this interact with different uh, environments, with different... And this is wonderful because I find, I found that uh, this opens the conversation to try to send to the company that you need to open source it, you, you need to share this with the community. Because at the end you are building something that can be shared and that I'm not going to go into the why of a choice goal, but this will turn more eyes on your module, uh, the maintainers that will give you feedback on that, you will be missing uh, security, um, security holes that you know, someone else will see. Again, I don't want to go into why of a choice goal, we don't know that. <laughs> Sorry, Gary. No, no, no. You're all right, you're good. Um, can can kind of So. Uh, with that said, I'm aware we're running shortish on time, so I'm just going to steam ahead to the last bit, which is the, the people for the job. Now, again, Alex uh, noted at the head of this session that there's a boatload of people required um, for the enterprise platform. And just just to kind of hammer it home, because I've, I've uh, had some interesting conversations where people have sort of eventually realise they need these team sizes, but they haven't been able to set it up in case they didn't talk about it early enough with the people that finance their projects they stole my dad's car keys and kind of zoomed off you know so they've never been able to actually build out the correct team for the job and it's really come back to bite them so um yeah which is basically what they're saying there so this is just it's just a representation really it kind of gives you an idea so even if you look at it from the yellow being uh say the client for an agency situation maybe and then the blue being the, uh, the delivery team. So you're, you're talking about even at the client side, uh, plat uh, product owner and platform owner, that I'm just saying these people are going to be split out, they need to be there, and they need to be there to um, you know, keep each other honest um, and engage with their stakeholders and make sure they're getting the right information so they can feed down as the program lead, the technical lead. And then you even need, you're going to need tiers of management on the, on the program side, you're going to need tiers of management on the technical side. Um, flowing down into 
um, a whole um, army of devs possibly, and then please, 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 please ensure there is a suitably sized army of QAs underneath those devs. Um, I have um, never been in a situation where I've had too much QA resource on a project, um, uh, and there, I don't think they can be. They are, they are um, amazing people that do amazing things, so make sure they're there for, particularly in this kind of enterprise zone, you're not just talking about testing manually the tickets that come through, you're talking about regression tests, because there's so many people using so many different sites on the platform. If you make one mistake, uh, it's not just one mistake on one site, it's one mistake on a thousand sites. So everything's kind of exponentially worse. So, you know, testing it, uh, the automation tests, the visual regression tests, keep those QAs there. And then you're going to even need just a, a whole separate function to ensure that that platform, whichever platform you're using, um, is is solid, reliable, uh, and up because you know these, these big companies need um, a real solid base. Otherwise, they might be losing millions of dollars every second they're not alive, you know that kind of thing. But you know, um, you got any further thoughts on that team structure, Alex, from your point of view? Yeah, it seems big. Like for example, you think on the technical side, like you have technical problem here, which is RTA kind of lead, right? Uh, you have RTA as well, which is you don't necessarily have to wait, sometimes you have two or three years when you have two or three different players, right? Um, I understand the need of that once I have to work, I have to jump another play where I can have the DA to help me, right? Because the technical program lead, for example, is responsible of a lot of things around the steer, the product, talking to customer, getting requirements, etc. right? So there are a lot of hidden gems, hidden tasks that uh, when you see uh, all the machinery working, you realize how busy this can get, right? So not having a terrible saying on the uh, right cross, it can put out of pressure on the team and can very easily uh, snowball to mistakes because yeah, you're too busy trying to find fight, right? Cool. And then even once you've seen all that, there's, there's other um, sections to this, uh, this group that should be considered, should be there, and often are not because people will think about getting to the point of delivering a product, but like when people think about the user funnel, think about it as a funnel, but it's not as an hourglass because this thing continues on it, as it uh, goes through life. So you need to, you know, once you've got the product built, you need uh, a support team there to um, be helping the user base because the engineering team are not the support team. Uh, if you start um, with a live product and you've got 50 sites running and each of those 50 sites is asking you questions about how they uh, enter content or that this button's uh, not quite what they expect it to be, suddenly the engineering team is not doing anything. So you need that support, you need that success team there as well to do the training, do the onboarding, otherwise you might suddenly find your product owner as completely vanished from view uh, because they're trying to onboard um, 20 sites in a week and they can't um, build out your roadmap anymore so you don't know what you're doing. Um, and <laughs> amazingly, um, internal product, external product, it doesn't really matter. Um, you kind of, you do need a, a marketing um, team going on. So uh, you can assume that just because you're building a product for an internal use, maybe it might be an internal tool, that you can mandate that and everybody's going to use it. It's amazing how many different ways people find to exercise their free will and go elsewhere. And suddenly you're in a situation where you're building out a a software as a service and people are not using that because you haven't listened to them, you haven't spoken about it, you haven't advocated it. Um, and that can uh, that can suddenly really backfire when you're you're losing your use space just as any any SaaS company might be scared of doing it and getting massive churn. So all these and this is you know there's many more as well, but just uh, be aware that there's a big team uh, surrounding these big projects. I'm thinking as well on the product owner and product platform owner was talking in the beginning about that and how it can overlap one with the other, but not really because it's not only the product owner is more business focused and the platform, for example, is uh, more technical, right? And their both jobs are to fight each other, right? Um, because, well, not, um, it's not like that, obviously, but um, the product owner will come with uh, requirements that it will come to you as uh, technical product leader or CA. And, you will say, oh, okay, this can clash with the platform, right? So you can sky brace to a platform over there and show that in order to you know, get some support. And at the end, it's what I was saying in the beginning, it keeps the whole ecosystem healthy because no one person can do something that can compromise the whole platform. 
so, to sum up, uh, Alex. Yeah, um, I was talking on the beginning about the big picture. This is, I wouldn't have to say this, uh, yeah, like a hundred times. You need to know what's the scope, what's going to be the planning here in two years. Uh, we've been in projects where we were getting requirements by drops, right? And this at some point got to be a big trouble, a big problem, because um, uh, uh, simply, a simple example, everyone is talking about trial builder and barracks, right? If you only know a small, a small drops of what's the whole requirement of the platform, you really don't know which one you're going to use. And for example, at the moment, we had the same parallels because two years ago, um, layout builder was not the same, right? And it was not known when it was going to be a good product, whatever. Um, the big problem is that a few months after that, we discovered that you have to support a synchronous translation. And that's a big problem with uh, paragraphs. I think I hope it is a lot easier to do. I mean, as I said, maybe it has to, it, it's going to make you change the whole architecture that you have defined, and it's going to waste time and money, right? Um, things like uh, iterations, um, I don't really know how to, you could improve that, but this is a big problem when you are working with, uh, like, the technology is to solve, right? If you have other requirements. But sorry, when you have different teams and you have to both work on at the same time on an integration, say, say Salesforce with uh, Drupal, um, that's a big problem because you have to increase. It's not that you're seeing a few, a few APIs and that's it. You need some beautiful Drupal and it interacts with its own more complex because you're building both things at the same time. So the, the communication and uh, between the teams is. It's trivial. Sometimes you have to jump in a room uh, for a couple of days and just talk about not even technical, not about how uh, Salesforce works or how Drupal or, or how an uh, MBA like in the middle interacts with the whole ecosystem of Salesforce Drupal, but more about how you are going to talk to each other, right? Yeah. And that kind of uh, flows into the step four, which is it's all about negotiation <laughs> and the psychology. And uh, if you really get stuck, it's the, the, uh, that the willingness to uh, escalate those issues and ask for help. Because um, in, a, in a large uh, enterprise, sometimes uh, it, people just use an escalation as a standard, standard way of doing things. So you might be scared of um, putting the cat amongst the pigeons. But um, sometimes that's just the only way people get things done. Because to be honest with you, they might delete all your emails unless you put them in the CC with uh, urgent on them. So uh, you might actually realise that stakeholders have never seen what you're saying until you escalate. So don't be scared to do that. And yet, as we just said, uh, please make sure you've got the right team, the extended team, uh, including those other factions like the success and the marketing and the support behind you to, to mean that the product is a success when you awesome people build it but also it's a success going forward because that just makes everybody happy and uh, means you're, um, you can be really proud ongoing of the things you've built. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, you've run out of time, so we probably haven't got any time for, for questions, unfortunately, but thank you so much for doing this. Um, no worries. Thank you, everybody, for uh, listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.